I think the thing that the Ice Bowl has that makes it totally unique was the elements. Uh, to have that great a game, that important a game, uh, played under those kind of conditions, there's really never, ever, ever been another game like it. It was a check on your intestinal fortitude. It was uh, mental toughness. It was discipline. It was all those things that football stands for. It was as cold as I'll ever be in my life. I'll never be that cold again. I will move before I be that cold again. The field was, oh, just ice. Ice. Terrible. And players were hurting so bad. And how they could run the ball and catch the ball, I don't know. Mind over matter, will. Under the circumstances, and as well as both football teams played. I think it's almost impossible to ask more from a group of players than was asked of them that day. And when the ice ball is discussed and, and rehashed, the talk is rarely about strategy and tactics, but it's always about human values, about courage, poise under pressure, and most importantly, the incredible resolve of two teams who pushed themselves to the limit with a world championship at stake. Dallas, want to toss? They'll receive. Green Bay will kick. We'll do it again at the end of the half. For the Dallas Cowboys and their coach Tom Landry, the 1967 NFL championship game offered a second chance to prove they could dethrone the kings of pro football. Dallas was sustained by the memories of 1966 when the Packers narrowly averted defeat in the Cotton Bowl. Well, the first year we played the Packers and lost to them, they had a much better football team than I think we did. We had a lot of young guys, we had a very young team, and that was giving us a year growing up. And when we first uh, played Green Bay in the uh, first game in Dallas, we were just happy to be there. I think most of the guys were just happy Jesus, we played in the Green Bay Packers in the championship game. And we played them close and we played them a pretty good game. Trailing by seven late in the fourth quarter, the Cowboys were inside the Packer five when the Dallas staff inexplicably made an ill-advised substitution. When we get down to the last play on the goal line, he sends Bobby Hayes in, which is not, it was a catastrophic mistake, because Hayes has never played on the goal line, has no idea what to do. Hayes was not supposed to really be in there, and uh, he was the guy that was to block uh, the linebacker, and we we're gonna roll out. And I didn't notice we didn't have the right personnel in there. So long story short, uh, Dave Robinson was back there before I was, and we flipped that sucker up, and uh, I just hit the guy that was open. A great goal line stand by the Packer defense. We'd just come off the championship game against Green Bay and Dallas. So going into the 1967 season, we anticipated being a pretty good football team. We were still young. We had uh, basically the same players. And as it turned out that year, we didn't have quite as good a beginning and quite as good a team as we, we had hoped because we had a lot of injuries. And uh, toward the end of the season, though, we started getting all of our players back, and we were uh, relatively healthy. We were pretty sure we were going to be in that championship. And we were pretty sure it could be Green Bay that we were going to play again. And I feel that we were setting plays up all year in the last, particularly the last six, seven games of the season, that we had set games up with different formations. We'd throw an odd formation in that we'd run another play from, primarily with Bob Hayes out to the side. But our overall team, we felt we were faster. That speed was showcased in the conference playoffs with Bob Hayes gaining 285 total yards as the Cowboys annihilated the Browns. That game we were ready. We just knew that they were not going to beat us, not the way we were playing at that time, and we were playing good and we were playing strong, and it was just no chance. Cleveland had no chance. Lone Star State fans sensed that this could be their year, but such pie-eyed optimism had hardly been the hallmark of the 1967 Packers. 
Green Bay was shooting for a record-setting third straight title, but age and injuries were taking their toll. It was the last season that Lombardi coached the Green Bay Packers. You know, we were getting old and the players were getting old and we, were, we didn't have the team we had in the, in the early 60s. Taylor and Horning were gone. I mean, that, you know, that was the heart of the running attack. Vincent had a falling out with Jim Taylor. I think it might have been over salary, whatever. And he wanted to prove he could win, even without those two great players. He wanted to win that second Super Bowl so badly. And they'd had a very average regular season. My goodness, a poor Steeler team had whipped them. Just winning and being champions carried a burden. <laughs> Clearly, everybody wanted a piece of you. It was like being, I guess, the old top gun in the old west. As we were going through the season, I think the guy tore an Achilles in the series later, as I went out, even before I had, I had found out what was wrong with me, um, Grabowski on in the very next series tore up his knee. So that was our starting backfield at that time. First time I can remember the Packers having to bring in guys from other teams or guys that were on the street to play, to fill in. Green Bay limped to a division title, but then the Packers discovered the playoff atmosphere offered just the tonic they needed to revive their championship dreams. The Green Bay Packers lost to the Los Angeles Rams out in L.A. just a couple of weeks previous to this game, and uh, we had even more motivation to beat them. Travis Williams in particular had a great day. It just showed me a lot about what the Green Bay Packers were made of, because we had been kind of struggling and uh, really came to the fore for that great championship series, beginning with the Ram game. And so it would be a rematch between two teams and two coaches who were more than familiar with each other. The Packers were like our arch nemesis to Tom, because uh, he and Lombardi had coached together in New York. Landry's theory of, of football was multiple offense, a whole lot, you throw a whole lot of different formations, and the Packers did, basically ran out of the split and set backfield and had maybe six running plays and six passes. He knew where they were going, and all they said was try and stop us. We knew going up to Green Bay wasn't going to be easy, but I think we arrived Friday. It wasn't bad at all. Saturday we went out and worked out. It was about 18 degrees, which is wonderful for playing. Don Meredith, he just said, you know, we were on the bus going to practice on Saturday, and he, he cupped his hands, looked back at the brand and said, this is going to be easy money, easy money. Meredith, uh, I think, was confident. We were in great spirits. We knew there was a cold front on the way, but we, we heard that it was going to be there sometime after the game. So if the, if it was, the weather was going to be anything like Saturday, we had great hopes. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Sunday came. <laughs> day when they woke me up in the North Star Hotel or whatever it was. I said, good morning, Mr. Covered. It is 6.30 in the morning. We had an early morning meeting. It is 29 below zero. I thought, well, you got to be making a mistake, but it wasn't. I remember at the hotel, we stayed at the Holiday Inn. They had to kick the doors in to get us out of the rooms that morning because all the snow had come in that night and actually the warmth from the inside of the room had frozen the door shut. And I thought, this is going to be a very interesting game. The Cowboys faced the extreme polar conditions with a mixture of fear and loathing. No one was prepared for this kind of weather. Even some of the Packers had trouble starting their cars and getting to the game. I saw a car going down the street, a flag to a kid down. He was going next door to visit his girlfriend. I asked if he'd take me to the game. He took my wife and I to the ball game. And only in Wisconsin, only in Green Bay, Wisconsin, the attendant came to my home, started my car, drove my car to the stadium, parked it in the player's lot, and locked the keys in for me. <laughs> Another group of men also found themselves on the road early that morning. We didn't have the clothes for that kind of weather. And we got a sporting goods store open and we were able to get it. earmuffs and gloves and thermal underwear. The Hardy fans soon arrived, over 50,000 strong, buttressed by all means of protection. Even the playing field was fortified, or so the grounds crew thought. The Packers had installed a heating grid beneath the ground, like kind of like a waffle iron, and that was supposed to keep the field from getting frozen. 
Oddly enough, Vince Lombardi bought the electrification system from George J. Hallis, who was a nephew of George Hallis, the owner and founder of the, of the Chicago Bears, which is another rather strange set of circumstances. And it, it was installed uh, late in the 1967 season, just immediately prior to the uh, ice bowl. It was used for the first time that day. And in fact, there's a sign that says this field is, is electrified. On top of this electric blanket on Lambeau Field, they had put the tarpaulin over it. So condensation formed. As a result, when they pulled the tarpaulin off that morning, there was like a 30 to 40 degree wind, and there was condensation that formed under the under electric blanket. The whole field froze. It was like an ice skating rink. And all of a sudden, someone said to me, well, they must have turned it off at night. And that was the rumor that uh, Vince Lombardi actually turned off the grid the night before to make it frozen because we had a better running game, we felt, and a better offensive game. The guys weren't thinking about their game plan and, you know, visualization and all the mental things that you have to do to be ready to play when the opening kickoff takes place. I mean, we were worried about how we're going to survive. Somebody got this idea that if we put uh, saran wrap on our feet, that we wouldn't get our feet wouldn't get cold. And guys were fighting over saran wrap. It was like a pack of wolves fighting over a bone. And all we had was some cotton gloves, like you see you work in your garden with. We didn't have any of these tailor-made gloves back then. So I said, well, guys, I'll just go with you all without gloves. I, you know, it'll be all right. After the first series, I came back to the sideline and asked the equipment man, I said, where are the gloves? I said, my hands are freezing off. I've got to have a pair of gloves. And Vince, before the game, he told all the defensive guys, he said, I want you guys to not wear gloves. You may drop a pass, and this is a big game. And so everybody said, okay, and everybody's mumbling and groaning. As he walked out of the stadium, I turned to the equipment man, I said, uh, I said, Dominic, uh, give me a pair of brown gloves. You'll never know the difference. <laughs> Our field mics at the time were long metal cylinders, and uh, the players frequently mistook these hand mics as hand warmers. So our sound man would be out there with this long metal cylinder trying to pick up bench sound and the players would look at it and then grab it with their hands and then muffle the sound so we'd get a lot of and we'd try to tell the players to get their hands off the mic because it wasn't a hand warmer. I remember Gifford up in the booth had a hot cup of coffee put down and in about a minute he picked it up and it was frozen he turned it over and the story goes that I believe it was Jack Buck said to Giff, you having a drink of coffee? And he said, no, a bite of coffee. And then the band came out to rehearse and they pulled a guy's lip off, the horn. So they said, there'll be no halftime band thing. Because of broadcast obligations and logistical nightmares, only passing thought was given to postponing the game. For better or worse, the ice bowl was about to begin. I think the thing that probably I remember better than any was the first play of the game when the referee blew the whistle. And when he pulled it out of his mouth, he pulled part of his lip off. And the blood started dripping down his chin, and it froze in an icicle. I blew my whistle to start the ball game. And I didn't really blow it. It was only a half a blow because it was a tweet. And that was the end of all whistles for the ball game. They all froze on us. So we just yelled, stay away, keep off them and everything. A sellout crowd has braved the coldest New Year's Eve in the history of Green Bay, Wisconsin to witness the 1967 NFL championship game between the Dallas Cowboys and Green Bay Packers. The mercury has dipped to minus 15 degrees, winds gusting at 18 miles per hour as we approach kickoff. That makes it the coldest game in league championship history. The previous low, a balmy five above in the 1945 game. The Cowboys haven't played in Green Bay since 1960, their very first year in the NFL, and they've never beaten the Packers in the regular season or playoffs. So here we go. Don Chandler kicks off. Deep to receive will be Craig Bainham and rookie Sim Stokes, who was activated after Pete Gent broke his leg last week against the Browns. Stokes' escort is Bainham. Bob Hyland tackles him at the 33. Here are the Cowboys' starting lineup. 
Meredith in the backfield with Reeves and Perkins. Rensel, Hayes, and Norman are the receivers. Connolly at center, along with tackles Lissio and Neely, plus guards Nyland and Donahue. The first play from scrimmage. Meredith looking left, spots Hayes open, first down yardage. Willie Wood drives him out of bounds after a 10-yard pickup. From the Dallas 43, Reeves cracks the right side, has some room till Dave Robinson and Henry Jordan bring him down. Second and six. Let's set the Packer defense for you. Davis, Kostelnik, Jordan, and Aldridge up front. Robinson, Nitschke, and Caffey, the linebackers. Adderley, Jeter, Brown, and Wood comprise the secondary. Meredith is going to throw again. He rolled right, but his pass is incomplete. Just out of reach for Lance Rensel, so Dallas faces third and six. Now Reeves again, trying to get to the outside. But Adderley's there. He stops for no gain. Dallas will have to punt into an icy wind. As you're out there reacting or whatever, you're not so much aware, but as soon as you, you know, are platooned off, you say, wow, this is one cold mother. Here's Villanueva's kick. It's a pretty good one. Wood takes it, and he's snowed under by special teams captain Harold Hayes at the Packer 18. Here's Green Bay's lineup. Starr, Anderson, Mercine in the backfield. Dowler, Dale, and Fleming are the receivers. Bowman at center, flanked by Skaronsky, Gillingham, Kramer, and Gregg. On the first play, Starr gives to Anderson, and he finds a hole, but he fumbles. Leroy Jordan made the initial hit, but it looks as if the Packers have recovered. And that should warm the faithful fans who are here in this bitter cold for the NFL championship. Second down five, Anderson to the right this time. And a huge hole. And he's very close to a first down. Jordan and Gector combine on the tackle. It'll be third and short for the Packers. Anderson again over center, and he's got the first down. Now, here's the Dallas defense. Towns, Pugh, Lilly, and Andre across the front. A veteran linebacking crew of Howley, Jordan, and Edwards. The deep backs are Green, Johnson, Gector, and Renfro. From the Packer 31, Starr on his first passing attempt. Down he goes, bowled over by Lilly and Andre for a loss of nine. Now Green Bay has its work cut out at second and 19. Starr is going to throw. It's batted away from Fleming, but the call, pass interference on Gector. More good luck for the Packers, who get the automatic first down at their own 31. Starr backpedals. It's to Anderson in the flat. Donnie's got it for a first down and a gain of 17. We had tremendous respect for their defense, and so we, we had designed a game plan which was both run and pass because we knew they were a, a better team than they were the year before when we played them in the championship game. Starr stays with Anderson. Donnie wiggles his way for about three. The former Texas Tech All-American is really carrying the load on this opening drive. Second down, and Mercine gets his first carry. He's into Dallas territory, but only for a couple. Jethro Pugh wrestled him to the turf. That brings up third and a long five. Starr will go to the air. Incomplete, but a flag is down. Defensive holding on Dallas. Automatic first down at the Cowboy 42. Anderson on the handoff, but he's smothered by Lilly who wasn't even touched. An obvious blocking mix-up, so it's second and 12. Now, Mercine on the draw play, picks up three, Edwards wraps him up. Helped along by a resounding hit from Renfro. So the Packers face third and a long nine at the 41. Stars going to throw. Carol Dale, wide open, takes it to the 24 before Mike Johnson finally brings him down. The field, it, when we first started the game, it wasn't 
totally iced up. It was it was iced up, but it wasn't. Uh, there was still traction where I, you know, out in the middle of the field. And even in, at the beginning of the game, we just let them have a couple of easy plays. Star to the air once more. Carroll Dale again near the left sideline. He eludes Johnson and is off and running. All the way down to the nine before Gector drives him out of bounds. First and goal for the Packers. Star with a give to Donnie Anderson. He picks up maybe a yard inside. Leroy Jordan, the first one there. Second and goal from the eight, and the crowd grows louder. Star back to throw. A bullet to Boyd Downer for the touchdown. But called an audible against the blitz, and I was kind of in tight at the split end position and broke down and in, and he just didn't uh, take the inside away from me. It was kind of an easy pitch and catch. Dowler really outfoxed young Mike Johnson on the pattern. 82 yards, 16 plays, nearly nine minutes eaten up. Chandler's point after is good. The Packers take the early lead. Here's Chandler's second kickoff, this time sending it away from the deep backs. It's touched by lineman Larry Stevens and will roll out of bounds. Stevens is leveled by John Rouser. That's where Dallas takes over at the 12, just under six minutes left in the first quarter. Here's Meredith's call. A delay to Perkins, and he spins his way through a hole for about five before he's met by Willie Davis and Dave Robinson. That'll set up a second and five situation from the 17. Meredith this time with a quick play fake into the flat for Hayes. Weaving his way through the Packers. First down yardage. Dallas trying to put together a drive of its own, trailing 7 0. From the 27, Perkins cutting left, but Leroy Cappy brings him down, a gain of three. The freezing fans try to stay warm with some applause for that play. Perkins again trying the left side. Henry Jordan closes in for the tackle. It'll be third and four. Perkins has been the Cowboys' leading rusher six of the past seven seasons. He gets his third straight carry, finding a big hole and another first down. Dallas has something going now. Meredith to pass. Protection good. Plenty of time. Finally throws, but it'll be incomplete. Reeves, the intended receiver, slipped and fell on the icy surface. That would have been good for a first down. Meredith, a delay to Perkins, but the Packers hold him in check. The Cowboys will have to throw on third and ten. Footing was not very good. We didn't get to do a lot of stuff that we could do. I mean, we had little quick pitches we were going to do, flips out the outside. So I think, again, some, you know, sour grapes or whatever it is. It's like we played a game, and I don't think we didn't have all of our guns working. Meredith throws, and it's nearly picked off by Dave Robinson. It was intended for Rensel. The Packers have held. Dallas will be forced to kick again. Danny Villanueva boots it. This one isn't going to go very far. Willie Wood with the fair catch. It's only a 33-yard kick. Green Bay will take over in the closing moments of the first period. Earlier that morning, dozens of butane heaters had been rushed to the game to help keep the players warm on the sidelines. Makeshift dugout bunkers had also been erected. The results for both were mixed. Right now, I can think I've seen better homeless shelters than this thing. It was kind of made of plywood and uh, some kind of a green tarp. So it was very kind of dark and just as cold inside as it was out. Maybe it felt like even the cold air was trapped in there. So I didn't get in there very much. Guys would huddle around these heaters, and one of them blew up, I guess, and uh, noxious fumes were all over the place. And, uh, you know, you went from being frigid to almost being fried. When your feet get cold, you have no feeling in your whole walking. You can't even feel yourself walking. And so you guys would come over and they'd take your cleats and put them up into that heater. But the only problem was it was melting you, the rubber on your, your shoes. It was just melting and falling off, and so you could smell it burning. You know, that's when you knew somebody was on fire around there. You say, you burn it up, and they just move the feet and put it back down in the ice, cool it off, and stick it back up there. The only thing hotter than the burning cleats was the Packer offense. 
which continued to roll at the start of the second quarter. First and 10 for the Packers at their 35. Travis Williams and Ben Wilson are now in the backfield. Wilson crashing the left side. Renfro finally brings him down after a 13-yard pickup for the Green Bay 48. Now Williams for his first carry. He slices left for another solid run, seven yards. Dave Edwards nabs him. The Cowboy defense is really back on its heels. Star with a play fake to Wilson. He's going deep. Dowler's got it. Goes in for the touchdown. 43 yards. He beats Mel Renfro on the pattern. The second one was play action, and they bit. Of course, Bart had to get me the ball, and I had to catch it uh, under those conditions, which weren't ideal. But uh, the plays were there, and they just worked. It wasn't a wonderful job of beating man-on-man -man coverage, and I just stayed upright and caught the football and got in the end zone. Chandler's extra point is good. The Dallas Cowboys appear to be in big trouble. You know, we weren't thinking about the Packers. We were thinking about the weather. And I'm not offering that as an excuse, but, I mean, I don't think it's any accident that when we went out in that game, we were down, I think it was 14 to zip. Even though the cold did bother us, we kind of projected an air that we wouldn't care about the cold. The cold weather didn't bother us. We were at home and we were used to the cold weather. And I think up until halftime, we really had them buffaloed that way. Chandler's kick is a squibber, finally fielded by Larry Stevens. A pretty good return all the way up near the Dallas 40, where Don Meredith will go to work. I think that the ball actually swells a little bit. I mean, the ball, it felt like it. The ball itself was bigger, but if it gets so cold on the outside, the air on the inside, the ball felt like it was getting closer to being a, a basketball sort of routine. More difficult to throw. Going for a bundle on first down, it's incomplete, intended for Hayes. Meredith's passes don't seem to have their usual scene today. Now Don will throw again, wafting the ball over the line, right into the hands of a leaping Herb Adderley. The all-pro corner dances toward the sideline, finally stopped after a return of 15 yards, and now the Cowboys are really on the ropes. After you forget about how cold it is and all the other things are going through your mind, you just figured you got to play football because they weren't going to cancel the game and they weren't going to call it off. So you better get in here and try to play and try to win, and that's when you just start playing better. From the Dallas 32, it's Wilson going left. But Mike Johnson and Leroy Jordan hold him to virtually no gain. Dallas must make a defensive stand here or this game could be over early. Second and ten, Starr goes to the air. Over the middle, batted down incomplete. Linebacker Dave Edwards, the one who just got a piece of the ball. So it's third and ten, with the Packers still well within Chandler's field goal range. Star will be throwing. He has time. But now Andre storms in, drops Bart for a big loss. All the way back to the 42, which not only kills the drive, but forces the Packers to punt instead of trying for the field goal. The Green Bay offense squanders a golden opportunity. I can probably thrown to the, uh, the X-Man, but I, you know, Travis, I saw Travis going. One wing square. square. Then I got you think up. he should have hooked it? I think so. See that? I got lost on him. See when he, uh, when he well, continues to do that because I couldn't pick up Renfro. I couldn't find Renfro. I couldn't oh, see him. Time to hook is it's just too long rhythm. Hey, right here. Come here, coach. Come on. Yes, sir. They're not defensively. They don't seem to be coming off the ball. Maybe 53 and 52. So yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. The Dallas defense had finally snapped out of its stupor, but the offense continued to sputter. One secret to Green Bay's success was their neutralizing of the Cowboys' most lethal weapon. Transformed from the world's fastest human to its coldest football player, Bob Hayes became an open book to any Dallas strategy. All week long, Herb Allen and, and Bob Jeter had keyed on Bob Hayes. So somewhere about halfway through the game, I talked to Bob. I said, Bob, how do you know Bob Hayes? I haven't heard his name yet. And he said, don't worry about it. He says, uh, said, you watch Hayes. He says, he keeps his hands in his belt. He said, he keeps in there keeping them warm. He said, the only time he pulls his hands out of his pants is when he's in the pass play. So if his hands are in his belt, I don't even cover him. When he pulls his hands out, I jump on him like a, like a blanket. He said, I cover him like a blanket. And he said, and uh, they, I, think, I don't think Bob Hayes caught very many balls off. But now, the Packers themselves were struggling to move the football. 
the crispness and swagger of their first two scoring drives had mysteriously vanished. Whether we began to back off subconsciously a little bit with that because of the weather and thinking well, maybe we'll be a little more conservative than we normally would because of the conditions, or this uh, would be very hard to overcome. I don't know, it certainly wasn't a part of my thinking, but maybe subconsciously we were. With less than five minutes remaining in the first half, Bart Starr was victimized by a doomsday defense with larceny in its heart. Starr will pass on first down. Plenty of time, but everyone's covered. Here comes the rush. Willie Towns drops Starr, who fumbles the football. George Andre scoops it up and takes it in for a touchdown. A stunning reversal of fortune as the Cowboys finally score. Well, I think mostly it was just straight ahead pass rush. And uh, I remember George racing after the ball, and he and he picked the ball up, and he got in the end zone. And George always was making big plays in those in the big games we played in. Jerry Rome holding Villanueva's extra point try is up and good. 4:04 left. Dallas has cut the Packer lead in half. So often, Lombardi's Packers had bounced back from such adversity with a score of their own. But the Dallas pass rush continued its carnage, while the Cowboys' veteran linebackers brought the Green Bay running game to a screeching halt. With the ball, Dallas fared no better, as both conventional and gadget plays backfired. With a minute 50 to go, the Cowboys punted, hardly expecting a second gift that was about to be handed to them. Villanueva hits a high, twisting spiral through a gusty wind. Woody Wood camps under it and fumbles. A mad scramble looks as if the Cowboys have it. Landry thinks they do. The officials agree. Phil Clark. The rookie from Northwestern makes the recovery. Dallas has its second big break of the game. Perkins gets the call, but he won't get much. Nitschke wraps him up. The gain was three, so Dallas faces second and seven from the Packer 14 with just about a minute to go. This time, Meredith will throw. Over the middle, incomplete, looking for Renzel. Defensive coach Phil Benson encourages his squad to hold for one more play. Meredith back to pass. Swings it wide to Reeves, who's got some blocking help. Finally, running into Nitschke, far short of a first down. Dan and Ray exchange a few pleasantries. Dallas will have to settle for a field goal. This will be a 21-yard attempt, although in these conditions, nothing is automatic. The kick is up. And it's good. Without the benefit of a single first down in this quarter, the Cowboys have scored 10 points thanks to the uncharacteristic generosity of the Packers. With only a few seconds remaining, Villanueva kicks off a squibber immediately fielded by upman Jim Weatherwax at the Green Bay 45. The Packers have all their timeouts, and let's see if they decide to go deep. No, Starr plays it safe. A handoff to Williams, who sweeps to his right. Leroy Jordan finally trips him up. Green Bay makes no attempt to stop the clock. There's the gun, ending the first half of play. Green Bay appeared to have this one well in hand. But two late miscues have put Dallas right back into it. At the break, the Packers by four. With the halftime program canceled, the shivering masses among the Lambeau Field faithful spent most of the intermission simply trying to survive the cold. Fans were tough to stay out there and watch that game. I have to give them a lot of credit. There's some tough people in Green Bay. And I don't know how those people stayed up in the stands the way that they did. Because when you're down on the field, you know, you're at least moving around. You're, you're working up a little bit. You're burning off some energy. You're, you're building up some heat to your body. Geez, just to sit in the stands must have been just sheer torture. You know, one person did die in the stands during, during the game of a heart attack. One, one man did die uh, during the course of the, the game. An older, elderly man died probably as a result of exposure, I assume. 
And people in the stands, their breath was frozen as they would exhale. And the frozen vapor was so prevalent that you almost couldn't see the people. It was like the fog coming in over San Francisco. You couldn't see anybody in the stands almost. And it was really kind of a surrealistic Salvador Dali type of ambiance. Coming up, the second half of the Ice Bowl. Still smarting from their dubious generosity and a half-time tongue-lashing by Vince Lombardi, the Packers began the third quarter the same way they had ended the first half, under a swarming pile of fast-pursuing Dallas defenders. And, to Lombardi's dismay, the Cowboy offense was finally getting untracked. The Dallas defense has kept the Cowboys in this game. Now the offense will try to get going from its own 11, 12.46 remaining. Meredith swings it outside for Reeves. Good yardage before Adderley makes the open field tackle. A gain of seven, making it second and three at the Dallas 18. Perkins to his left and a lot of running room. An eight yard pickup and that gets Landry's attention. The first Cowboy first down since the first quarter. Now Dallas is looking for more. Meredith spotting Frank Clark. That would be good for another first down. Don Meredith started hitting some passes. We are running game. We got some uh, running plays going uh, with Don Perkins and I running the ball and had a real good drive in the third period. Kept the ball away from uh, the Packers for you know a long period of time. Running some you know quick pitches, some sweeps uh, outside, and took probably six or seven minutes. Reeves 20-yard pickup puts the Cowboys on the Packer 32 and the Lambeau faithful don't like what they're seeing. First and 10. Meredith slips but still got it to Reeves who finds more daylight. The ball will be spotted at the Packers 29 slightly under 10 minutes remaining here in the third quarter. Meredith back to pass. Lots of protection. Over the middle, Rensel has it for 11 yards, and another Cowboys first down at the Packer 18. Reeves to the outside, but Leroy Cappy nails him for a loss. I remember in the third quarter when we were really struggling, Leroy just rose to the top. When we were down and we needed something, Leroy Cappy was the guy. He was seen that he was always he always played great against Dallas Cowboys. I mean, being from Texas. Every time someone made a big play in that game, it picked up the whole defense. And Leroy did it two or three times. He had some big plays that game. Meredith's protection collapses. He's out of the pocket. Scrambles upfield, but it's Caffey again, stripping him in the football. Adderley recovers for the Packers. Linebacker, you know, from Green Bay ended up hitting uh, Don and knocking the ball loose, and they recovered it. Uh, and we came away with no points. I think that was a big that was a big factor in the game too. Is anytime you have a turnover, it usually comes away to you know to to hurt you in a ball game. The one man's breaking outside. See, there's no use to send him out. Yeah. Just tell him to slow box. See. All right. And that way you have no key for hunting. As the Cowboys evaluated what had gone right on their drive, things were mostly going wrong for the Packer offense. The bitter chill was wearing away at the defending champions, and the icy field was wreaking havoc on the line's precise blocking patterns. I just remember how hard it was uh, keeping your balance. You had to make sure that you kept your feet under you because one slip, if the defensive guy has his footing, he'll be on your quarterback. Soon, Dallas was tantalizing their sprinkling of fans in attendance with a second offensive drive. From the Packer 46, it's Reeves picking up where he left off. Another big game to the left, good for 11 yards and a first down. Dallas is on the move. 4.15 to play from the Packer 35. Meredith drops back. Fake to the left, a toss to Reeves. Finally, Nitschke closes in to hold Dallas to a gain of three. Second and seven, and it's Reeves once more. Willie Davis hangs on with help from Nitschke. The Packers limit him to a gain of two. It'll be third and five from the 30 as Dallas attempts to keep the drive moving. 
Meredith to pass. Caffey comes out of nowhere and drops him for a loss of nine. Leroy Caffey with his third big play of the quarter, and the Packer defense has held again. This will be a 47-yard field goal try for Villanueva. Rome is holding. The kick is up, but it'll be way short. Willie Wood fields it at the four. All the way to the 27, where Green Bay will try to overcome the Cowboy defense and the deteriorating playing surface. Your execution was totally fouled up based on the field conditions. It got worse as the game went on. The timing that you needed in the running game for the, the blocking patterns to set up and spring the back free and to make a cut was almost impossible. You didn't have a chance. Green Bay now facing third and four at their own 33. Starr will drop back. And it's Dave Edwards along with Lillian Jordan who tackle him for a loss of eight. The Dallas pass rush has been superb today, totaling seven quarterback sacks. And Green Bay's offense has truly gone into a deep freeze. Donnie Anderson's kick is almost in the clouds. Hayes calling for a fair catch. Dallas has the ball at their own 45, 12 seconds remaining in a fast-moving third period. Likely time for just one more play. Perkins running right. He's got five as Kostelnik and Robinson close him down. That's the end of the third quarter, a quarter totally dominated by Dallas. Yet the Cowboys still trail by four. In the third quarter, the revived Dallas offense had done everything but score. As the fourth quarter began, that was about to change. The play was a, a green left formation, a fire pass, pitch 48 T pull, halfback pass, and I can remember it was the first play of the fourth quarter. The Cowboys have it at midfield, facing second and five. Meredith on a pitch out to Reeves. But this one's going to be a halfback option. Renzel all by himself takes it in for the touchdown, a 50-yard strike as the Packers were caught napping. When we pitched it out and I was running with the ball, I noticed both the safety and the corner both coming up, which meant that Renzel would be open. And I will never forget the joy that I felt as I came down on, I think it was Willie Wood, I'm not sure, on simulating the block and seeing uh, peripherally both guys forcing. I'll see that image to the day I die. And when I threw it, I thought I, you know, had a chance to overthrow it, but the wind was into our face, and thank goodness, you know, it held it up. And I had to turn around, and I remember the joy turning to fear as I had to try and negotiate a turn to catch the ball over my inside shoulder. It was been a difficult play, and I don't think the Packers expected it either, for sure, that we would throw a pass like that. And, and it did. It was a big play. It, it really put us in a really good position to win the game. Villanueva's extra point try is good, and with only eight seconds gone in the final period, the Cowboys have their first lead of the day. The Dallas defense finally had a lead to protect, and it did so with such ruthless efficiency that virtually everything Green Bay tried was unsuccessful. The Packers picked up only three first downs throughout the third and much of the fourth quarter, with Bart Starr spending an increasing amount of time on the rock-hard turf. Run or pass, neither worked for Green Bay. But the Cowboys soon discovered that simply communicating with each other in the brutal cold was a task that proved to be just as arduous. I remember Meredith in the huddle went to Rimmery, Hurry, ho, or who? I went, what? Rimmery, hurry, ho, or who? I said, Dog, time out. You know, what was happening, his cheeks were freezing, and he couldn't form words with his mouth. And so Meredith literally massaged his cheeks to be able to form words. Mere words were starting to fail everyone by now. But the Cowboys' message was clear. They seemed content to sit on their lead and let the doomsday defense continue to work over Star and his Packer teammates. From their 18, the Cowboys have to give up the ball. Villanueva gets off an excellent punt. 
It drives Wood all the way back to his 38. Now, Willie tries to set up his blocks. It's going to be a penalty on Dallas. Wood was grabbed by the face mask. The guilty party, number 21, Dick Daniels, a rookie defensive back. That will put Green Bay inside Dallas territory at the 47. Weather conditions are worsening by the minute as Starr will pass. Complete to Dowler for a first down. Ground was hard frozen, the ice was frozen on the ground, it was sharp as a razor. I mean, if you fell on the ground, you could rip your jerseys to shred just like somebody taking a razor and cutting it. If you thought AstroTurf was hard, I mean, AstroTurf was like a pillow compared to this. This was like falling on jagged concrete. On second and nine, Star back to throw. Howley comes storming in and bats away Bart's pass. So it'll be third and nine with a little over 10 minutes left on the clock. Star again. A deep drop. Looks like he's setting up the screen. Incomplete. Anderson never turned around to see it. So on fourth down, Chandler is in for his first field goal try of the afternoon. Don's 40-yard attempt is up, but it's going to be both wide and short. The Cowboys cling to their three-point lead. Time may finally be running out on Packer hopes for a third consecutive NFL championship. Dallas takes over at its own 20, 9.44 left in the game. They'll try to eat up as much time as possible. Perkins gets them off to a good start, but then he runs into Willie Wood. The gain is good for five. Green Bay fans hoping for another defensive stand here. Dallas stays on the ground with Perkins. He gets maybe a yard before Caffey and Kostelnik slow him up. Bart Starr watching on the sidelines, hoping he'll get another chance. Now Perkins on his third straight carry. Second effort gets him a couple, but it won't matter. The Packer defense was offsides, so that will give Dallas a first down at their own 31, with 8.29 remaining to be played. Reeves gets the ball, makes some solid yardage, five more until Willie Davis grabs him. Second and five, Dallas will just keep on pounding until the Packers figure out a way to stop them. This time they might, as Reeves is tripped in the backfield. Finally corralled on a resounding tackle by Kostelny, setting up a third and ten situation. Meredith will throw. Nothing over the middle. Don looks at the outside. He spots Frank Clark, who gathers it in for a clutch catch and first down yardage at the Dallas 41. 6.45 left in the game. Perkins will take it. Not much there this time. Obviously, cold is a factor, and you're aware of that. But I, I think you're more hampered by just the fact that you can't hang on to the ball, you can't turn, you can't cut, and then the cold is kind of a secondary to the inability to perform out there. Meredith slips, gets back up, fires incomplete to avoid a loss. The Packer defense does its job. Dallas will be forced to punt. Villanueva has kicked well his last few attempts. This one looks good, too. A 39-yarder as Willie Wood hauls it in. Harold Hayes finally nails him at the 32. 4.50 left in the game. This possession could represent the Packers' last chance. That last drive started, yeah, like 60 some yards ago. And I thought we brought the farm. I, I was I was trying to, I was saying, holy man, I hope my car is in the parking lot so I can drive, get out of town <laughs> as soon as possible. Ray Nitschke, his voice was just about gone. And he was an awesome sight. No teeth missing and so forth. And his voice, don't let me down. This was to star and the offense. And then as if to say, and in case you didn't hear me, don't let me down. And, and it sent chills up and down your back. I don't think that there was any doubt in anybody's mind that we had to, or otherwise it was over for us. And uh, I think the execution during that drive, uh, I don't know that that execution under those conditions will ever be surpassed. In a moment, the thrilling conclusion to the ice bowl. All the way 
down to the 11 and out of bounds. We were ready in that last drive. We were totally focused on what we needed to do in order to go down and win this ball game. I don't want this, that to sound trite, uh, but we did. And when I looked into those faces, uh, all I did was then just call the play. The Packers begin at their own 32. Star disguising with a double fake handoff. Finally dumping it out in the flat to Anderson. He's ridden out of bounds by Green and Howley. That stops the clock, sets up a second and four. From the Packer 38, Mercine gets the call. He chugs his way over the right side for a sizable gain. It's going to be good for a first down. Chuck rolls out of bounds and kills the clock with 3.57 remaining. At the Packer 45, Star back to pass. Dowler gathers it in for another first down and is knocked to the turf. I caught a ball that got us over a 50-yard line when Cornell Green uh, slammed me down on the ground and bounced my head like a basketball on the, on the ice. And other than that, I don't think we actually threw the ball downfield only one time in that drive, and that was it. 3.30 left at the Dallas 42, and Anderson is buried by Towns for a huge loss. I should have been the guy to block Willie Towns on that play because that was my responsibility. But I had my head on the outside a little bit of, of, of Willie. He made a great move to the inside, and he flat out beat me. Cowboys took away the wide receivers after we'd thrown uh, uh, one to Boyd Dowler. They were doubling them, which was a good call on their part because that forced us to go slower down the field and to pick up larger chunks of yardage. On second and 19, Starr spots Anderson on the right, who slips away for a 12-yard gain. Chuck Mercine and those guys were not real fast, so you didn't have to worry about them outrunning. You know, all you had to do is just get in position, you could make the tackle, but on that uh, sheet of ice, uh, we just had several opportunities on that drive to make the play and just couldn't stand up. Two minutes to go, Green Bay looks at third and seven. Star straight back. He finds Anderson again, who sidesteps a tackler and picks up the first down. I think we were stunned by the weather. Uh, it had gotten colder and colder, and by the end of the game, it was 69 below zero chill factor. And the last time they had the ball, the last drive, I don't know, it seemed like we sort of choked up on defense. It was not just one of us, or it was the, kind of the whole team. I don't think we'd ever really been in a pressure situation like that. I noticed that their two outside linebackers were taking straight drops rather than dropping more or less to the sidelines when we flared. So I noticed that if I could get outside of this guy, outside of my linebacker, I would have a free run. And I mentioned to uh, Bart, if you needed me, I was open in the left flat. 135 remaining from the Cowboys 30-yard line. Star dumps it off to Mercine. All the way down to the 11 and out of bounds. The field froze about that time in the fourth quarter. If we'd have realized it quick enough, of course, we'd have been in the zone defense. Instead of that, we were in a man-to-man. -man. And so when the fullback swung outside, Dave Edwards broke for the play. And when he did, he fell. And that was the big play of the game because it gave him a chance to score. Here we come back to the huddle now, and I get the call. 54 give. Absolutely, I'm really excited now. You need to have the defensive tackle get influenced by the, our offensive guard pulling. Bob Skoransky also had to make a great seal block, which he did make. Great block, unheralded, but really important in this play. 1-11 remaining, first and 10 at the Cowboy 11. We're seen again, crashing through a huge hole down inside the five. A brilliant call from Bart Starr, and Mercine nearly takes it in. 54 seconds to go. Anderson barrels over center. First down yardage. We're down in very close proximity to the goal line, and, and I'm, I'm confident we're going to make it in. But lo and behold, we're having some trouble getting it in. They call a couple of dive plays to our halfback to Donnie Anderson, number 44. Both times, Donnie slipped. So with the final timeout with 16 seconds to go, Bart went to the sidelines and decided to run 31 wedge. 
And that was a play that uh, had been suggested in the, the Thursday movies. When we were looking at the Dallas Cowboys short yardage defense, I noticed that Jethro Pugh was higher than Bob Lilly on a goal line charge. And I said, Coach, if we need a wedge, we can wedge Pugh. He didn't make idle talk with Coach Lombardi. You better have something serious to say when you had something to interrupt him about. So he ran the film back about three or four times. He said, that's right, put in the wedge. It was our lead play on short yardage in a down and distance situation like that. And when I told him that they could get their footing, and I said, Coach, I'm up underneath the center. I can shuffle and lunge my way into the end zone. And this is also typical of Coach Lombardi. All he said in a crisis time like that was then run it, and let's get the hell out of here. <laughs> you can see Lily trying to dig, chip some ice out of the ground. Matter of fact, he suggested we call a timeout and get a shovel dig the ice up. And a couple, couple times I scuff at the ice, but my feet was too numb to pound it. It all comes down to this. A third straight NFL title for the Packers riding on this play. Can Dallas turn back Green Bay? Could there be overtime? Star calls the signals. He keeps it himself and is into the end zone for the touchdown with 13 seconds on the clock. Amazingly, none of the Packers had any idea that Starr would run the ball on a play designed for the fullback. I took off, fully expected to get the ball, and lo and behold, Bart did not turn around to hand me the ball. He dove in himself. A couple things were going through my mind, but the most important one was don't assist him into the end zone. And I couldn't pull up because it was so icy. So I threw my hands up in the air like this. So the very famous picture looks as if I'm signaling touchdown. What I'm honestly signaling is to any referee that was watching, I did not push him in the end zone, which would have been a penalty, which would have negated everything. Jerry hit Jethro, and I got into him, and I kind of pushed him into the end zone. Probably the only game in my professional career that I can honestly say that as an offensive center, I had a key role in ending up uh, putting the Green Bay Packers in the Super Bowl. If we hadn't scored on the play, the clock would have run out and we'd never kicked it. I don't think with that, for 16 seconds, I don't think we could have lined up our field goal team and kicked it. So it was all or nothing at all. Here's Chandler's point after attempt. It's good. So a field goal won't help Dallas. They'll need a miracle touchdown to pull this one out. The year before, the game was decided in the final few plays, just like this one was. And, you know, my feeling was, one, a big disappointment. My God, it's happened again. You know, it, it's happened again the same way. Chandler's kickoff is short. It takes a Packer bounce, rolls into the end zone. Sim Stokes picks it up, but is strongly advised by his teammates to down it for a touchback. The fans are just aching to celebrate. They'll have to endure these final moments. From the 20, Meredith will need to make a desperation throw, firing long downfield for Renzel. Over his head, incomplete. Mercine and the rest of the jubilant Packer bench can just about taste victory now. Seven seconds left. Meredith will have to throw deep and pray. He's going for Stokes, who's covered tightly by Adderley. It falls incomplete. The clock has run out. And the Green Bay Packers, in one of the most thrilling comebacks of all time, have beaten the Dallas Cowboys to win the 1967 NFL Championship. It's Bedlam here in Green Bay where the Packers have just won their third straight NFL crown by beating Dallas 21-17. Let's head down to the victorious Packers locker room and my colleague Tom Brookshire, who is standing by with Bart Starr. The root out you get, uh, you've thrown the long bomb many times, but uh, was any yard more appreciated than the one you, you got, Bart, when you had to have it in the closing second? Well, I don't think so, Tommy, particularly the fact that we were having real poor footing down there. And we, you know, we had some couple of good plays we felt in that situation. We couldn't even put it in with those. Uh, the backs were sliding when they would start, and really, we had run out of ideas. We didn't know what to do. Bart, you went to the turn-in stuff uh, with Boyd Dowler and, and with the Carroll Dale, uh, feeling that perhaps the traction was good enough to where they could back off uh, 
reading these people and step inside to make the catches. Was this your idea? That's about right, yes. Uh -huh. What about, uh, they did throw you eight times, uh, but it, it looked like you maybe just couldn't find an open receiver. Was, it, was the secondary for Dallas doing a great job? Yeah. You're a real fine analyst. That's exactly what happened, and I think you should uh, take no credit away from Dallas, but also don't uh, misname our offensive line today because they did a real fine job for them. I think a couple of times I should have tried to throw the ball away, but I was pressured there and I wasn't real sure. In fact, on the fumble, I'm sure I should have thrown it away somewhere. But uh, that's exactly what happened. They did a fine job of covering our receivers, and I just had to eat the ball. Uh, Bart, how about the third down and one call? Is this a, uh, I know Green Bay likes to do this on third and one uh, when you hit Boyd Dowler straight up against the win for the for the touchdown. Uh, is, is this a normal call for you? Do you like that third down and one situation where you can play action pass it and, and float deep? Well, it's, it's strictly a gamble, as you know, and uh, we were lucky on that one, and uh, you have to be lucky. If, if you miss on those things, uh, you look like an idiot, but uh, we were lucky enough on that one. It worked out fine. You know, the one you hit Carol Dale with, a short pass, uh, the 86, I think you call it. I recognize that. Uh, you, you put you're going to be giving our secrets away here. <laughs> Bart Stahl, you did a great job. You're a, you're a fine leader, and uh, uh, like I say, I think the adversity of the ball. We'll get back to Tom in just a moment. But as we watch the wild celebration, here's a reminder to everyone in our audience that tickets are still available for the Super Bowl to be played two weeks from today in Florida. You can obtain them by contacting Miami's Orange Bowl Committee at the address appearing on the screen. The Packers will be meeting either the Oakland Raiders or the Houston Oilers, who will determine the AFL champion later this afternoon. Now, let's return to Tom Brookshire in the jubilant Green Bay locker room with head coach Vince Lombardi. Hold you. And well, I think I think we gave him a lift, and uh, we gave him a big lift with the uh, with the fumble recovery and uh, for a touchdown, and then uh, and later on with the with the drop punt. We gave him ten easy points, and that gave him a lift up until that time. Of course, I you know I thought we we had control of the ball game, but the pendulum swung a little bit on, on those two plays. Coach, do you feel the footing was uh, detrimental uh, blocking for both offensive lines or anything? Well, the footing the footing wasn't as footing was not as bad as it uh, must, uh, possibly might have looked. It was not as good as we had hoped, however. It'd be, uh, we had 12 degrees. There was nothing much we could do to hold the, to hold the uh, soft ground. Bart Starr uh, had trouble getting first downs until he had really had to have one, until the final drive. Now, what do you tell a uh, quarterback on the sidelines to suddenly get the, the ball club moving? Well, it's not a question of what you tell them. It's just a question of what the ball players realize looking at the clock that they only have a few minutes left or whatever, and they just, they just uh, arrive. We didn't uh, do anything differently. We put in, we added one little play from the sidelines, and that was it. That was it. Coach, we're going to have a play right now. You can see it on this monitor. I hope I can see this it. This is slow motion now as Jerry Kramer makes a key block for Bart Starr on this quarterback sneak for the winning yes. touchdown. Yes, yes. A super defensive play, but as you will see, Jerry Kramer blows him out of there. Yeah, that's a fine block, and it's a real good... past you said that your Packer teams had character. Uh, can you compare this with any of the other ones? Everybody always says, is this well, one of the greatest it's, Packers It's a little teams? bit too early to compare with anything with anyone. We have another game to play, so we'll have to wait before we, we give this club any kind of a name just yet. We'll have a name for them, though, pretty soon. Coach, how many days rest, how many days rest before uh, getting ready for the big one? Well, we have... We'll come back to work here Wednesday. They always work for Vince Lombardi, right? That's right. Good luck to you. Coach Thank you. Team. Thank you. The Packers that day became the first team and the only team under the playoff system to win three consecutive NFL championships. So it was a great accomplishment and I think there was a sense of that and yet it seemed like a very sober dressing room for a team that had just done what they had accomplished. Uh, in fact, Bart Starr had tears in his eyes, you know, he was uh, tears of joy I'm sure, but just nevertheless uh, not quite the, you know, the reaction you might have uh, expected from somebody who had just had a great triumph. And I remember Vince saying something that I thought summed it up very succinctly. He said it took all of our poise, all of our experience. I'm sure he was referring to the last drive, which produced the, the victory. And I thought that that pretty well said it. For the Dallas Cowboys, the last second defeat in the Ice Bowl was a shattering experience, both spiritually and physically. It was awful cold, and a lot of people came away with kind of a frozen, or you, you know, your face was kind of frozen, your fingers and all, and a lot of people were hurting after that game. Defensive linemen played the entire game without gloves, and most of them had frostbite from it. My feet and hands still bother me in cold weather, uh, you know, just 
tingle and burn, and, uh, and I, I hate cold weather because of it. That loss is the single most devastating loss that I have ever gone through. And I remember going back on the plane, and, and uh, not a word was said. And I have never been on a plane, a team plane, after a victory or win when that was the case. It hurt us for a while. It took us time to get over because I think a lot of us thought that we were a better team in 1967 than the Packers were and the fact that they beat us and beat us in such a dramatic fashion uh, did take something away. It took us a while to get over it and made you really understand how difficult it is to win a championship. While the Cowboys suffered in silence during their homeward flight, the Packers celebration was also low-key. Instead of a lavish banquet at a restaurant, the victory was noted by only a modest New Year's Eve gathering in Vince Lombardi's rec room. After the game, Coach Lombardi invited my father and I to his house where he was going to have a post-game party. And there you saw Lombardi, not as the fire-breathing, butt-kicking, all-conquering coach, but instead uh, we saw him as the, the doting grandfather and, and a gracious host. Big John. <laughs> laugh everybody, laugh everybody, come on, come on, laugh, come on, come on, come on. Oddly enough, there were two things that were omitted from, from the conversation. Number one, there was no discussion of the Super Bowl at all. I mean, nobody even mentioned that game. And then also, there was no discussion or no even hint of his imminent retirement, which would occur uh, in a matter of months after the Super Bowl. Super Bowl II was an anticlimax, an effortless win over the outmanned Raiders. It was a much easier game for us than, say, Kansas City was the year before. Her badly intercepted a pass and took it for a touchdown for us. Donnie Anderson did well. He ran well. And Boyd Dollar cut a long touchdown pass. I think we won 33-14, but there was no doubt that we were a dominating team for that game. And I think, as players, we were almost afraid that he would leave us. And nobody wanted to talk about the time when he wouldn't be here because of this great inspiration he was to us. And because of the corporate structure of the Packers, I believe it is impractical for me to try to do both jobs, and I feel I must relinquish one of them. Fortunately, I have had a very capable and a very loyal assistant. Gentlemen, let me introduce to you now the new head coach of the Green Bay Packers, Mr. Phil Bankston. Within two years, Lombardi would be dead of cancer and the Green Bay Packers would not return to the Super Bowl for nearly three decades. Ultimately, two questions still linger about the ice bowl. The first concerns the game-winning touchdown. Should it have counted? Was guard Jerry Kramer offsides? As the ball was snapped, there was a flash in my mind that Kramer had moved slightly before the football. And the thought in my mind is that he was offside. You could see me saw a look from one side to the other side and see the referee had thrown a flag. If you uh, freeze frame that and slow it down to uh, super slow, uh, you can see that I moved maybe a frame or so before the ball. I wasn't offside, Bowman was a little slow with the ball. There's certain fundamental things you do in those situations. You don't gamble when life or the game is on the line. You put your face in the defensive man's chest. And that's what I tried to do then, to be as absolutely certain as I could that I was going to be able to do the job. Jethro Pugh played on the Cowboys' defensive line for 14 seasons, earning two Super Bowl rings. But little of this mattered to many who unfairly singled him out for losing the ice bowl. Only years later was he finally vindicated. I had a son, and one day he came home and said, guess what, there's an article of people where Kramer admitted that he was offside. And I think he was more thrilled than I was uh, because, you know, a sense of relief that I basically wasn't a the scapegoat but losing the game. The other question is not as easily resolved. Is the Ice Bowl the greatest game ever played? I don't think there's any doubt that it's 
It is the greatest, it's the most memorable game in our history. And by the way, we've had two separate polls over the last 20 years. And in each case, the uh, ice bowl is one hands down as the greatest game in Packer history. We won five world championships, which you could call a dynasty in the 60s. That was the climax. That was the pinnacle moment that capped the whole thing off. I don't seriously doubt it. that was the greatest game ever played. No, that's taking in a lot of football games. Uh, under the conditions, it was probably the greatest game ever played. I would have thought it was a lot better game if we had won instead of lost. I would probably rank it as, you know, the best game, but uh, it's definitely one of the top games that I've ever participated in because it was close and, you know, went right down to the wire. It doesn't make any difference what part of the country you're in or what, what country you're in. Anybody that knows anything about football said, you played for the Green Bay Packers. Did you play in the Ice Bowl? What that game meant was unbelievable. We had fought all year to get to that point. It had been a tough year. We'd won two consecutive championships prior to that. And then to have it come down to this and the bitterness of this particular day and to win it in that fashion. So from our perspective, I think it was the greatest game of all time. This NFL Films production has been brought to you by the National Football League. The NFL is online at www.nflfilms.com.